Good morning, Living Hope. How's everybody doing today? Excellent. So good to, uh, to see you on this day. I'm glad that you are uh, here and uh, ready to worship the Lord. We have a few things that I just want to uh, share with you today is that uh, on our website, we have a digital connection card that we would love for you to uh, fill out and take care of. You can find that at uh, lhwc.net. And it's on the right side, and uh, it's a plug-in, and you can uh, click that, and that will get you connected to our connection uh, card, and that would be uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Helps us to keep in touch with you, and so we would love for you to do that, especially if you're uh, new with us today. Uh, just a couple other announcements, reminders about uh, our. Uh, giving options. If you would like to give towards Living Hope, you can do so in three different ways. You can mail in your, your tithes and offerings. You can drop them off in the box right behind the sanctuary, or you can use our online giving tool. And uh, that can be found on our website, LHW, LHWC. I almost put in like an extra C in there. Um, that wouldn't be correct. Um, also, just a reminder for moms, dads, and teenagers, Tonight, we will not be having our uh, Bible study. Uh, enjoy whatever it is that you're doing this evening. If you're watching the Super Bowl, go Bengals. And uh, you can enjoy just some uh, time alone with your family. If you're uh, not cheering for the Bengals, go Rams. If you don't care about the Super Bowl and you just want to eat food, enjoy that as well. Um, practice some moderation because that's always important, right? Okay, it is. It is. I promise it, it is. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's really it, it's about uh, taking time to just be with family. And that's what we're uh, we're trying to do this evening. And so we're taking a week off. Plan on uh, the youth Bible study getting back together next week and uh, getting back into the book of Phili uh, Philippians. Uh, you know, sometimes the words just combine. And I did I say Philippians? Because that's what I was thinking. And I meant to say Philippians, and I don't even know if I even said Philippians. We're going to whew, keep on going. Um, other things that are going on, you know, we have our, uh, our life groups that are continuing to meet, and we uh, invite you that if you are not in a life group, there are options for you to be joining a life group, and we would love for you to do that. We also want to invite the, uh, the men on Friday mornings at 6 a.m., for a uh, study and then just time with guys and uh, would love for you to be a part of that. It is well worth your time and we promise to always have at least a one decent cup of coffee. Um, if you're lucky, we have two. If you're really lucky, we have three. And uh, for those of you that aren't coffee drinkers, um, bring your own beverage. That's no problem. Um, but anyways, uh, it is about being in the Lord's house and worshiping him. And I'm so glad that you're with us today. Uh, we're going to just take a moment and we're going to pray and ask God's blessing, not on just our time together, but that he would speak to us as we hear his word today. And then we're going to dismiss our kids for uh, kids for missions today. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much. Thank you that we have this great opportunity to be, uh, be present here, either in person or online. And God, we know that uh, it's an easy thing for us to get up and come to church, but sometimes there are circumstances going on around us that prevent us, or we think it should prevent us. But I'm just so thankful that in the, in the grand scheme of things, it's easy for us to wake and to get to church. But Lord, we also know that it is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice for us to come and to give up of our time. And we know, Lord, that it is a joy for us to be together as a body. It is an absolute joy where we get to interact with one another. We get to have an opportunity to uh, benefit through relationship each other and build each other up. And so, God, when we gather like this, we're so grateful that we have a body of believers that want what is best for us, because that's what you want for us as well. And so we thank you for that. God, as we, as we worship today in a variety of ways, may we not just uh, be thinking inside, but thinking outside, thinking about you and who you are, and that you be lifted up and worshiped. 
because God, you are worthy of that. And as we'll find out today, there is no other reality, no other person, no other thing that is worthy of the worship that you are. And we thank you for that. God, may you enrich just our minds, our hearts, our souls as we worship you and hear your word spoken to us. May we be challenged by it. And may we also realize that you alone are God. And Father, as we do these things, may, may we uh, lift your name up. We pray these things in your son's glorious name, the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to dismiss kids ages uh, four to fifth grade for kids for missions. You meet your leader in the back and uh, go over for your time of worship today. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This passage of scripture, as uh, we found out last week, is titled the Shema. It is uh, the series that we're in, and uh, it begins with the word here, and that is the Hebrew word Shema. We translate it as here. And this passage of Scripture, as we talked about last week, is beyond just a passage of Scripture. It is powerful. It has a deep root in Jewish lives. And uh, I would just encourage you that if you missed last week to go back and listen to it, because there's a lot of information that I passed on last week that talks about the importance of the Shema, the importance of Deuteronomy chapter four, verses uh, six or in chapter six, verses four and following. There's a lot that is within there, and I would love to give you a, uh, a Cliff Notes version of it, but I'm not going to. So you can go back and listen to it because there's a lot of things in there. And just a reminder that one of the things that the Jewish folks did when they read that passage is that they covered their eyes so that they could focus on this passage of Scripture. Hear, O Israel, that the Lord your God is one. So let's talk about this word, Lord. That is the key word that we're going to be looking at in this series. That's what we're going to be doing is we're going to be picking out the key words. We're going to unpack them a little bit. Talk about it from the perspective of uh, a early Israelite perspective, but then also kind of get a little bit bigger and then hopefully draw a little bit out for what it means for us today. So let's talk about the word Lord. Now, I have it up here on the screen, and I want you to notice that, first of all, that the word Lord uh, will appear at times at, in all caps. And if you didn't know this, the reason for that was to distinguish the difference between the divine name, that is Lord, and the usage of regular Lord, not all in caps which can be used for the word or can be used to mean master, king, or even sometimes shepherd. And so the, the capitalized version is to take us back to what is called the divine name, Lord, or Yahweh. 
And this divine name is the one that we're talking about today. Then, And if you remember back when Moses encountered God in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is given the name for God that he would use to tell the people of Israel in Egyptian captivity who sent Moses to them. And we have the name Yahweh. And many times we find that they abbreviated the word with Y, capital Y, H, W, H. Interesting note about the Hebrew language. This is one of the reasons why I love this language. Uh, Not only is it not read left to right, but it is read backwards from right to left, which if you ever do uh, read Hebrew, that takes a little bit to get used to, but kind of fun. And early language, they didn't have vowels. They just had consonants. And so they would insert those later on. And that was also very fascinating. But the Israelites honored this name Yahweh so much so that they stopped saying the name altogether because it was honored, revered, and they felt like in their uh, existence, their sinfulness, that they should not say the divine name Yahweh. And so what they did is they replaced it. They replaced it with the word Adonai. You've heard that name, name before, right? Adonai. And eventually there was another adjustment that was made because the Israelite scribes didn't want an accidental usage of the divine name. So sometimes they'd be translating and they would see, come across the word uh, Yahweh and uh, they would just immediately change it to Adonai. But that's what they read in their minds. They didn't always have it written out. They would translate it for themselves. So you're reading along and you see the word Yahweh, but you actually forget that that you're supposed to say Adonai instead. They didn't want that to happen. So they actually created a hybrid word that would replace in the, in the ancient scriptures, the word Yahweh with a hybrid of Yahweh and Adonai. Okay, I should have done this in, uh, up on the screen because this would make a whole lot more sense. Okay? So take YWHW, and then you have the word Adonai. They would insert the word Adonai, and they would take the, the vowels, and they would be Y-H-O-W-A-H. Long word. And what they would do is this would be the word Yehovah, or Yahuwah, and that became the translated word of Jehovah. Okay? Now, if your pastor would have been really on top of it today, he would have had all those words right up on the screen, and this would have made a whole lot more sense. So what I'll do is I'll fix this for you so that you can see it uh, uh, at some point in time. So what would happen is, is that when the Christian scribes came along and they saw this word, Yahuwah, They changed it to Jehovah, and they didn't know that there was this hybrid word put together that actually wasn't a word at all, and it was quite fascinating. Now, all that to say that when we read this word, capital letters, L-O-R-D, what we are saying is that word originally was the word Yahweh. And the people in Hebrew, in Israel at time, Israelite time did not use that word because they revered that word so much so. Typically, we don't have that type of mentality, do we? We don't stop using the word Lord because it's a, it's a different word for us. Now, sometimes we don't use the word, the, uh, the Lord's name in vain, right? But sometimes, sometimes we do. Sometimes we hear it and we don't know what to do about it. And sometimes um, we, we don't have this reverence for God's name. I wonder, I wonder if, if we did have a reverence for God's name, how would that change the magnitude of our language? How would that change the way in that we communicate? If we had such a, a, an understanding of God's power, 
would we stop taking the Lord's name in vain and the way that we communicate because of our relationship with him and the knowledge of him? I wonder what would happen if we did that. But I think before we need to even consider, we need to understand the power of God's name. So for the next couple of moments, I'm going to unpack a few, uh, two very important implications, and then we're going to talk about 10 things that this word Yahweh means for us. So hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. You with me? Okay. Hear, O Israel. You're not with me. Okay. Cover your eyes. We're saying this together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There you go. You guys are on your way to seeing the big picture of this passage of Scripture. The first thing I want to talk about is God's oneness. Okay? It says that the Lord is one. And, and the Shema reminds us of the monotheistic declaration about our Lord. Monotheism is defined as belief in one God. Mono meaning one Theos or theism, uh, meaning God. That this is in comparison to the other cultures and other religions that surrounded the Israelites, not only when they were in Egypt captivity, but then they would go to Canaan. They lived surrounded by people that believed in a pantheon of deities, meaning multiple gods. And they had these cultures all around them that had a God of everything. Okay, think about it for just a moment. The Egyptians had a God of the sun, a God of the river, a God of the sand, a God of the, uh, the moon, the, I already said the sun, the stars, anything and everything had a deity represented for it. And the Israelites are being told as they are coming out of captivity that there is one God that they were to worship. One. Moses, it is, it is clearly defined and he clearly believes that loyalty, obedience, and love to the true one God is the only way to life. One of the greatest threats to Israel and their future was dividing their allegiance between many gods. And so this Shema is a daily reminder that the Lord our God alone is our God. The, the prayer goes on from there to show the great value of passing this conviction to later generations to spare them of the results of idolatry to other God's little g. And Deuteronomy chapter 4 speaks to this as well, especially within the reminder of the power that God showed in the deliverance of the Israelites from captivity. And this is something that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of moments is how Scripture talks about God's oneness. Okay, so don't miss this. Keep your ears peeled and open and ready to hear the, the, the importance of God's oneness in these passages. Deuteronomy 4, 35 through 39. And, and keep an eye out for the, the reminders as well. Verse 35, you were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. From heaven, he made you. Hear his voice made you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth he showed you his great fire, and you heard his words from out of the fire, because he loved your ancestors and chose their descendants after them. He brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength to drive out before you nations greater and stronger than you, and to bring you into their land to give it to you for your inheritance as it is today. Acknowledge and take heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. 
Moses is laying it out even before the Shema comes around and he is telling them as the law of God is being established, there is no other God but God, but Yahweh, which can not only be translated of I am, but is I am who I am. I will always be. This is the God of heaven that Moses is talking about. And in, in, in Nehemiah chapter 9, when the Israelites are reaffirming their faith in God, they're also reminded of God's oneness. Verse 35, you were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. From heaven, he made you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth, he showed you his great fire, and you heard his words from out of the fire. Once again, the oneness of God many, many years later is being confirmed and reminded upon the Israelites that the way that you were up, ended up in captivity is because of your ability to forget that God is one. That's why you were in exile. That's why you ended up where you were. Forget that and come back to what you know that God is one. One, one God, what, the oneness of God. And it's confirmed not just in the Old Testament, but let's look at the New Testament in, each, in Ephesians. I have a hard time with that word today. It's messed it up twice already. Ephesians chapter four, verses four through six. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Let's just recap that for just a second. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. There is no other God but God alone. Yahweh, Adonai, Jehovah, one, one God. And then in Jesus, in John chapter 10, verse 25 and 30, uh, when he's confronted by the unbelief of the religious leaders and on the verge of being stoned. And when they ask if he is the Messiah, he responds in a very amazing way that confirms not only, not, not only does it confirm the oneness of God, but it confirms the oneness of Jesus and the Godhead and the Trinity all wrapped up in this. And Jesus answered, I did tell you, this is verse 25 of chapter 10. But you do not believe the works I do in my father's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. And while we talk about the oneness of God, it's important for us to remember that we believe in the Trinity, the Godhead, the oneness of God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this doesn't diminish the importance of the oneness of God, but it actually magnifies it in the way in which we look at God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The oneness in three persons. So, I hope that you, you get the, the importance of understanding that there is one God. One God. The, and His oneness really matters. Now, let's talk about that there are no other gods. If we talk about God being one, that means that we have to talk about that the fact that there is no other gods. And so when we say that, when I say that, I'm, I'm really saying the, the word gods in a little g form, meaning that 
There is, there's one God. There's no little ones. No, there's no little tiny guys running around. There's just one God. And because of God's oneness, we have to discuss the reality that there is no other God. And this talks about his uniqueness. I showed you earlier Deuteronomy chapter 4 that speaks of God's uniqueness and the de- declaration that there is no other God. You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Beside Him there is no other. And folks, that would have been a very difficult thing for the people of Israel, Israel to, um, to wrestle with because of their proximity surrounded by people that believed in the pantheon of God. When they went into Canaan, while they they uh, removed the people that were living there. The people still were, uh, there were still folks that were not Israelites living within those communities and they had to wrestle with the uh, the religious practices of those people of that time. And they had many different gods that they worshipped, Asherah, Baal, and many others and if we if you remember that there was always a difficulty that the israelites wrestled with when shortly after they moved into canaan the book of judges is full of it you continue on from there and you keep on reading into David's time period. They are dealing with the Philistines and they're dealing with the Amorites and the Hittites and all of those. Every single time we hear about those other people and their religious practices, it was a threat and a difficulty that the Israelites had to wrestle with. And we know how some of that played out. Think about Samson for just a moment and the way in which he gave up some of his uniqueness and his belief at different turns across his life and what it ended up doing in his life. Psalm 86.10 says, For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. The psalmist is reminding us that there is only God alone. Paul in the New Testament reminds us in the church of Corinth where he is talking about the the context is talking about foods that have been sacrificed to idols and Paul brings out that within that conversation there is a um, a oneness and an only God scenario within there. So Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 4 and following says so then about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing in all the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, notice little g, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and from whom we live, and there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Paul talks in this section about the importance of recognizing that that the idols are not God. The idols that the people were worshiping were not and cannot be the Lord God, Yahweh, but they are little g and lowercase l's and g's. And in Paul's thoughts, the worthiness of anything but God other than God can't hold a candle to our Lord. Nothing else is worthy. I also need to say that Paul uh, does talk about other issues within this passage, but his view of idols and their unworthiness is important to note that he considered all of those other beliefs and religious systems to be inferior to God and our belief in Jesus Christ. And so it's very important that we check that out and we understand that. Now, I want to bring it home with some other additional thoughts from Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. I referenced this passage last week, and I realize I am throwing out, throwing out at you reference after reference after reference, because the Bible is full of reminders that we serve one God. 
one Lord, and there is no other God but him. Jesus is asked in Mark 12, 29 through 31, he's asked what is the most important commandment, and Jesus responds with a quote of the Shema, and then he includes the command to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, what I didn't share with you last week, and I should have because I think it is really important, and we might be coming back to this often because it's the value and the importance of it is, is huge. I didn't share the response of the teacher that asked Jesus that question. So verse 32, he says, uh, well said, teacher, he's speaking to Jesus. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. This dude is getting it, right? He's on top. He's, he's understanding what's going on. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, I did not include, I just remember that I didn't include the rest of what Jesus said to this man in chapter 12. So I'm going to read it for you because it is valuable to hear. Jesus responded to him after this man responded very wisely. He said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So, so this, get this. The guy asks Jesus, what's the most important commandment? What's the most important one? And Jesus reiterates the Shema perfectly. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second command is just as important to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And the guy responds, that's a great answer. And I think you're right. There is nothing greater than to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But what he says after is so important. More important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. It, it, it's, it's about what you believe with your head and with your heart and how that makes you live not the religious practices of burnt offerings and sacrifices. That's not what <coughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> That's not what matters. That's not what matters. It's about knowing the Lord, your God and loving him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That is everything of who you are. Get that. It is everything, your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we're going to talk about those in a couple of weeks. But it is everything of who you are. You love him with all of your being. And you love your neighbor as yourself. That's more important than showing up Sunday after Sunday at church. Whoa. Yeah. Because when our heart's not in, all we're doing is we're just showing up. It's more important than sacrifices and offerings. It doesn't matter how much we give to the church. It matters with the heart in which we give. It doesn't matter how kind we are to our neighbor. It matters with the heart that we are kind to our neighbor because we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. That's what matters. And that's how we live. But if we're just going through the motions of religiosity, we are far from the kingdom of heaven. So we continue. I came across a, a list of 10 things that John Piper, a retired pastor in Minneapolis, and I'll just out of complete disclosure. Um, John Piper and I are on different views of the spectrum of theological issues, but there are a lot of things that we can lear learn from people that are, uh, think a little bit different theologically. Um, we're just on different spectrums and that's okay, but we can learn some things. And he said some really great things about the importance of uh, 10 points about what the, Yah the word Yahweh says about who God is. 
And you need to hear these because I think they're important. And they're things that I haven't said yet, so they're really important. So uh, jot them down, take notes. Uh, first one is this, is that um, the name Yahweh says about God is that there is no beginning to God. No one made God. God simply is. And when we hear the word Yahweh, it's the reminder that God is. I'm going to try to not go fast through this so that if you're taking notes, you're, you're keeping up with me. The second one is this, is that there is no ending. When we hear the word Yahweh, there, it, it means that there is no ending. If he did not come into being, he cannot simply go out of being. God is. Third thought is, is that Yahweh, God, is the absolute reality. There is no reality before him, outside of him, or beyond him. He is all that was eternally. No space, no universe, no emptiness, only God. When we hear the word Yahweh or God, we are saying that he is also utterly independent. Meaning that he depends on nothing for support or counsel. He relies on himself. He is utterly independent. And the flip side of that is that everything that is not God is totally dependent upon God. The entirety of the universe is secondary. It came into being by God and stays in being moment by moment on God's authority. So everything is dependent upon God. You, me, creation is dependent upon him. Sixth is this. Hopefully I'm not going too fast. All the universe, by comparison to God, is nothing. All that we are amazed at in the world and in the galaxies is compared to God as nothing. The, the vastness of the world beyond us, creation, you, you name it, the vastness of it is nothing compared to God. That takes a lot for my brain to comprehend, but I hope that you get it because that just reminds us that his creation, it's not even up to his little pinky, tip of his pinky in comparison. Number seven, God is constant. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. He is the only thing that is constant. Number eight, he's the absolute standard of truth. God doesn't look up in a law book to know what he doesn't know. To know what is right or beautiful or truth. He himself is the standard of what is right, what is true, and what is beautiful. Number nine, God does whatever he pleases, and it is always right, beautiful, and within truth. And number 10, God is the most important, most valuable reality and person in the universe. He's more worthy of interest and attention and admiration and enjoyment than all other realities, including the entire universe. And I share these with you because I see that when we look at that list, sometimes it helps us to see the vastness, the bigness, the understanding of God that is beyond ourselves. I'm not in the uh, 
in the habit of just giving you list after list of list of things. But I think it was really good. So where does that leave us today? If I were to wrap this up, how, what would I say? What would, uh, what would be the things that we would want to understand? First of all, it's crucial for us to get the understanding of God right. If we don't get this right, other things won't fall into place. If we don't understand that God is one and that there is no other God besides Him, we will let a lot of other things uh, come into our life that are false, that are not true. We will allow things in that will distract us from God. So it's absolutely crucial for us to understand that He is one and that there is no one but Him. So the practical thought today is this. What things have you allowed or what things have we elevated to a position that they shouldn't be in? Let me be a little bit more blunt, okay? What belief, what ideology, what philosophy, what item, what practice has been placed at an equal level or even a higher level than God, than our Lord in our lives? So for you, for me, what have we taken that is valuable and important in our lives? And we have, we have this idea, this knowledge that God is one and there's a, a uniqueness to him and that there is, a, uh, there is no other God but him. But we have taken things that shouldn't be and we have either placed them equal with God or we have placed them above God and said that values God. That is more important than my understanding of God. For far too long, we as a society, we as a people, we as individuals have let little g gods get in the way of our vision of who God is. So I'm asking you for just a moment, what is it in your life? What's that thing in your life that is an idol and it's got to be put away? It's got to be put in its proper place and it is not in the position or even close to God. So what is it for you? Is it politics? Let me give you just a, a brief little thing. Jesus, God, they're not Republicans. He's not a Democrat either. It's not what matters. We can have ideologies, we can have philosophies, we can have thoughts about how we read Scripture, but He does not serve the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. Not at all. Not one bit. And to be quite honest, I could care less whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. You know what I care most about? Your heart for God. I could care less about all that other stuff. Do I have an opinion on them? Yeah, I do. You do too. Do we need to have everybody think like we do? Not necessarily. Can we agree to disagree? No, we can't do that anymore, can we? We should be able to. On the grand scale of things, does politics matter to eternal security, eternal life? No. It doesn't. And we need to quit beating people up because of our political leanings. Okay, enough about that. Is it entertainment? Is it the movies that we watch? Is it the things that we do for enjoyment? 
Is it things that get in our way? Is it relationships? Have we elevated relationships to be over God? Some of us, yeah, we have. Money, we have put over God. (laughs) We've put being right over God. Because we see it every day. And I'm I'm talking culturally. We have put religiosity over God. We've got to get our view of God right. And we've got to get to the point where we don't allow anything, anything to step in the way of our view, our thoughts about the God that we worship. And we've got to be able to realize that what matters most And I'll be very honest with you that we've got to let these idols that have crept up into our life be destroyed. As the prophets cut down the Asherah poles and the temples and the shrines to Baal and to other gods. We need to do the same in our lives. Get rid of the things that are taking the place of God. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead us in a prayer of repentance. And I'm going to invite you to just join me in prayer. And if God is working on your heart today, not going to ask you to do anything other than to just allow yourself to melt into God's presence and confess in your own life your need for repentance and seek him today. Not going to ask you to raise your hand, not going to ask you to do anything along those lines, but I'm just going to ask that you, if God is speaking to you, deeply repent. Father, we come before you today and just recognize that in the life that we live, we have let far too many things come into a higher place than where they should be. We've let things such as the things that entertain us to be at a place of idols, things that we worship and spend too much time on. We've allowed ideologies and thoughts about specific things to get in the way of our view of you, God. God, I pray that each of us would feel convicted by your Holy Spirit today. I pray that we would surrender control of the the idols that are so easily placed up and propped up in our lives. I pray for the things that we place in competition with you, God. And I pray, Father, that we would have the courage to break down those idols. God, I don't know how that's done specifically in each person's life, but I know how it's done in my life and that you would be drawing me back to a right understanding of who you are, that you alone are God, that you alone are God and there is no one like you. Develop within us a reverence for your name, a reverence for the relationship that we have with you, that nothing would get in the way. Draw our heart to you, God. We want to hear 
your word spoken to us today. So speak in our lives, God. I pray, Lord, that there would be things that we have never thought about as being an idol that would come into our mind and remind us that we have placed that thing at the forefront of our lives and not you. God, it could be as simple as items that we possess, our cars, our homes, our toys. It could be the technology in our pocket. It could be the relationships that we're a part of. It could be the the thoughts of politics that we think matters, but it's not. God, it could also be the things that we think about church that don't trump, that don't overcome you, but we place them at the forefront of the relationship and they're an idol. God, that was what the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the religious people in Jesus's day were doing is that they were, they were taking the laws and the rules and placing them above their heart's desire for you. And God, I pray that if we have that type of mentality that we would confess it today and know that our heart can be changed And that we can put first things first. So God, we pray for that. We pray for your work in our lives. Holy Spirit, convict us this day of the idols that we have in our lives. And help us to repent. We confess, Father, forgive us of our trespasses. God, we thank you that you speak to us. And Father, I just want to thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We pray all these things in your son's glorious name, the name of Jesus. Amen. As we close out today, I'm going to invite the worship team to come and lead us. Let's uh, let's sing our last song for today. Would that be all right? So uh, go to our last song, and we'll uh, close our time together in worship. Thank you so much for being a part of uh, worship today. Those of you that joined us online, we're so glad that you're here as well. Uh, God, uh, we are just so thankful for an opportunity to be together. Let's stand and let's sing together.